it's almost 1115. Um, we're having a little bit of technical difficulties. Uh, our main speaker, Sherry Dupree, was on and then something happened to her Zoom and she disappeared. So she's in the process of trying to reconnect. Um, but thank you all for coming. We'll give everybody a couple more minutes to, um, to get on and hopefully Sherry will be able to come back on. How you doing, Jackie? Good, good. good. Welcome, everyone. Thanks for coming. I keep seeing more little boxes pop up. Um, so uh, this is our usual Sunday seminar. And um, so I would ask everyone who's not speaking to mute just um, so that Zoom doesn't get overburdened when you're not speaking. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the uh, Alachua County Community Remembrance Project first, and then Sherry Dupree will join us and talk about the history of racial terror in Florida. Um, afterwards, when she has questions, I'm going to try to help um, identify who's, who's asking questions, but please be patient because um, it's, it's hard on Zoom. Uh, just, you know, raise your hand and unmute and we'll, we'll get to everyone. So thank you all for coming. Um, while we're, I mentioned uh, some of you are still coming on. I mentioned we're having a little bit of technical difficulty getting Sherry here. She was here and then disappeared. Um, and now I see your Zoom box, Sherry, but not your, your video. Anyway, uh, while she's working on that, I just want to introduce by telling you all a little bit about the Alachua County Community Remembrance Project. Uh, I know uh, many people from this church uh, participated on the two bus trips we've made to Montgomery, Alabama, and others of you have also been or are aware of the National Memorial for Peace and Justice and the Legacy Museum in Montgomery, Alabama that was founded by the Equal Justice Initiative. Um, so last January, um, we started our own community remembrance project in partnership with Equal Justice Initiative in Montgomery. You know, our long-term goal is, of course, to bring the monument for Alachua County here to Alachua County, the twin that hangs, you know, there's one hanging in the, um, the National Memorial for Peace and Justice, and then there's a twin that they have in the yard that they give each uh, county when they begin doing their own truth, truth and reconciliation work. Um, they haven't started distributing those yet. They're waiting for counties to do significant truth and reconciliation work first. So what our group is doing is uh, we're working to educate the public about the history of Jim Crow and racial terror in Alachua County and about the 48 known victims of racial terror in our county. Um, we were one of the highest uh, counties uh, in terms of numbers of lynching per capita uh, during that uh, horrible era. So uh, the Alachua County Community Remembrance Project is doing educational events. I know many of you, this is one of them, and then many of you participated um, in the storytelling event last Sunday. Um, and uh, we're also having more events coming up. Um, there's a community, there are different groups for each of the municipalities in um, Alachua County. So I'm gonna share my screen for a second and just show you um, the website that the county has. This is the um, Truth and Reconciliation website that the county did. And it's truth.alachuacounty.us is the website. And then if you click on Community Remembrance Project here, uh, these are all the different committees. There's one for each area, Gainesville, the leaders, Evelyn Fox, um, and then Newberry, it's Jordan Marlowe. Um, there is a Memorial Quilt Committee that Don Beachy is um, uh, the chair of. There's a school board essay contest that Don Fitzpatrick is the chair of. Uh, we have a trauma-informed committee and community education. So it's, it's a pretty broad group. 
um, and all are welcome to join. If you have any interest in joining any of these committees, you can just go to this website and click on um, one of these, you know, you know, email one of the leaders and let them know, or you can call Latoya Ganey and her number is listed here at the top. The other thing I wanted to share is that we have a Facebook page. It's Alachua ACCRP and um, listed on it, you'll see, you know, uh, events like Thursday night, there was a wonderful community forum that the Alachua Noonansville group did about the history there in Noonansville and Alachua. And then if you missed the last Sunday storytelling event, there's a link to that on our Facebook page. Okay, so stop sharing and, um, oh good, Sherry's back, I'm so glad. But anyway, um, some of the things that the uh, group is doing in, in addition to the educational events is we're having um, uh, ceremonies to honor the victims of lynching by collecting soil from the sites where they were lynched. And um, the first one will be February 5th. And the group that Sherry is working with, the Newberry group is doing that. And we, you will all be invited to come to that and just check the Facebook or the website for more information. Um, in February, we hope to have a historical marker installed in Gainesville. And that will be Gainesville 20, uh, February 20th is what we're shooting for. And this will honor the um, 13 victims specifically uh, in Gainesville, 13 known victims. And we'll also be doing a um, soil collection ceremony. So um, these will all be offered uh, online live streaming if we continue to be in a pandemic mode then, which we probably will, but um, uh, I encourage everyone to participate in these. Uh, I feel like it's an act of uh, truth and reconciliation to be witness to these events. So um, if you have any questions about participating in the Alachua um, Community Remembrance Project, uh, just call me or email me. Oh, another thing I wanted to mention is uh, currently the Gainesville group is doing a high school essay contest. And this is open to all um, high school students in Gainesville High School. So specifically, Buholtz, Gainesville, SciTech, and PK Young. And um, later there will be one for Santa Fe High School for the kids that are in Alachua and La, La Crosse. And there'll be another one for Newberry High School and another one for um, uh, Hawthorne. Uh, all of these contests have pretty significant prizes. Uh, the, the first prize is $2,500. Uh, the second prize uh, varies depending on how many entries there are, but it's either a thousand or $1,200. And then a third prize I think is 750 and a fourth prize of $500. So this is a really great opportunity for our, our young people to learn about the history of uh, racial terror and how that has uh, impacted on our current uh, disparities that we face here in Alachua County, how it's directly related to that. And it also is an opportunity for them to, um, to win some prize money. And these are judged by Equal Justice Initiative, not by local people. And they're not judging it on grammar, they're judging it on content and on how well the writer understands that connection between that history of racial terror and the current disparities. Uh, and the, uh, so the information will be, there'll be a newspaper article in January about it, but also it'll be on our Facebook page and the uh, website truth.alachocounty.us. And um, the high school history teachers should know about it also. So um, be sure uh, you tell any high schoolers in your community about this great opportunity. Um, so I just wanted to mention more people have joined. So if you're not speaking, please mute so that we don't overwhelm the Zoom. And- um, Jackie, I have one question. Okay. 
This is Betty. Would you list the uh, different schools for the essay contest? Yes, uh, it's Gainesville High, Eastside High, View Holtz, SciTech, and PK. It's all the public schools in Gainesville. Okay, thank you. And the website, uh, I'll find it and post it in the chat while Sherry is speaking. Okay, thank you. Um, and it will also be on the truth.electrocounty.us website and on our Facebook page sometime later this week. Um, so we have the, the honor of having Sherry Dupree today as our speaker. Um, Sherry is a local historian and very active in the Newberry Truth and Reconciliation Group, which is really the first group that formed here in Alachua County. And um, they're leading the way and have, as I mentioned, they're doing a soil collection ceremony on February 5th. And uh, two representatives from Equal Justice Initiative will be coming for that soil collection um, ceremony. We're really excited about that. Uh, I think it's gonna be uh, a great event. And if we're still in the throes of the pandemic, it will be live streamed. So mark your calendar for that. So um, if everyone will mute, when we have questions and answers, I'm gonna do my best to, to recognize everyone, just um, raise your hand and, um, and be patient and um, welcome Sherry Dupree. And thank you so much for coming to talk to us about the history of lynching here in Florida. Sherry, you're on mute. Sherry, you're muted. Let me unmute. All right, you hear me now? Okay, very well. I'd like to thank everyone for coming. This is the history of racial violence in Florida. And would you put the first slide on Deborah? Deborah, okay, yes, okay, you got the slides on? Thank you. The history of racial violence in Florida. We'll skip the first slide because Jackie has already given us such a wonderful introduction to let us know what we're dealing with today. And of course, um, we move to slide number two. The next slide is showing the Equal Justice Initiative, the National Memorial for Peace and Justice, which is located in Montgomery, Alabama. And this is just showing one of the outside pictures of the uh, area. We would move to the next slide, please. The third slide. Now we're gonna deal with atrocities in the state of Florida. In 1902, in Half Moon, that's very close to Newberry, there was an, a very serious atrocity that you will learn more about. In 1916, in Newberry, we had the Newberry Six. In 1920, in Okoye, we had the, the Okoye Massacre. In 1923, we had the Rosewood Massacre. 1947, in Mariana, we talk about the White House boys, where so many men were placed and young guys were placed for detention. In 1949, we talk about the Groveland Four. 1951, we will talk about MIMS, Florida, and we will talk about Harry T. Moore and the NAACP. And in 1952, we will talk about Live Oak, and that's in Swanee County. And I'll keep you wondering who you're going to hear and see and deal with when we get there. Will we go to the next slide, please? In 1902, uh, in Half Moon. Half Moon is a little small area and it's uh, in Alachua County. There were two boys and these two boys were lynched on September the 2nd in Newberry, Florida. Could we click on the link there for Newberry? At the bottom. Now this is, uh, okay, we can just leave it right there. So the, new, the two boys were uh, accused of stealing and these two boys did not steal. These two boys were lynched on September the 2nd in Newberry at Lynch Hammock. 
Their names, Mandy Price. He was 10 years old. And Robert Suggs was 12 years old. These young men had cleaned the fields. And after they got done cleaning the fields and working, they saw another group of guys and they were bloody. And evidently they had been involved in taking, killing some hogs or killing some animals. In a few minutes, uh, some others came and they thought that these two boys were involved. They were not. There were white guys that were involved and they got away. So the two African-American men, boys, were taken to Newberry and they were hanged in 1902 on September the 2nd. This slide shows the Lynch Hammock area. If we go to the next slide and we're gonna see a gruesome picture. So please be prepared for this picture that you're gonna see next. This picture is the Alachua County area of Newberry showing the five people that were lynched. The names of those victims are as follows. You had Mary Dennis, Stella Young Long, Andrew McHenry, Gibbert Dennis, and Reverend Josh Baskins. This picture shows them after they were lynched and put on the ground. You can see that their hands were still yet uh, tied. And it shows the men just the bottom portions there, their feet and legs after they had uh, taken them down from hanging out at Lynch Hammock. This was in 1916, August the 19th. Would we go to the next slide, please? The next slide, please. Thank you. Now, I mentioned those names again, and I mentioned them because they are buried right here in the Jonesville area, in the Pleasant Plains Cemetery in Jonesville. Okay, and now in 1916, that church was known as an African Methodist Episcopal Church. Today, it's the United Methodist Church. And of course, it's at the Pleasant Plains Cemetery where you can visit that cemetery and visit James Dennis's tombstone and a couple of other tombstones that are in the area. We will move on to the next slide. Okay, I don't think, all right. Our next slide is the Lynching Memorial. Since this happened in 1916, uh, in June uh, 24th of 2002, and a memorial service was held. And the service was held because these were good citizens. These were African-American good citizens that lived on land that they had purchased themselves and family members had helped them with it in Alachua County. Now, the town of Newberry was a small town, and today it's still a fairly small town. But it was known, and it has been known, because of these lynches and others that have occurred. It was the common place to take yeah. people to the lynch hammer, as you already know from the two boys that were taken. In this case, uh, the lynching memorial was held, and we have to mention Dr. Patricia Hilliard Nunn because she and I and others put together this in 2002. And once we went there and had the ceremony, there were people that came from all around to see and hear what was going on. All the attendants held candles and we had them to have a prayer. This was held at the East Park over in Newberry. And we had prayer, of course, and we had several people to talk about the issues that had occurred. Now you want to know why in the world did we have what was known as the Newberry Six? It started <clears throat> because of hog stealing and they were looking for a man named Boise Long. Boise Long, it seems, went to visit the Dennis family or was in the Dennis's care. The mob thought that he was there and they were trying to reach him. And in trying to reach him, uh, he was gone. So therefore, they killed one of the dentist uh, men out in the yard. And then from that, uh, things got very upsetting in the community. Okay, from that point on, 
um, the white mobs went back and they took the Dennis family, said, we're going to have someone to, for this situation. And so when they went back to the Dennis family, they gathered up several family members and all the folk there and carried them and put them in jail. While they were in jail, now Boise Long was still out and family members and African-Americans in the area were frightened because they didn't know what was going on and they were afraid. And of course, the next morning, uh, they saw these bodies hanging. And that was the picture that we showed you. There's much more history that I can share on that, but we will deal with that at another time. But the main thing is that five were lynched at Lynch Hammock on the 19th. And then the other person, Dennis, was killed. He was walking. They were killing people all around in the area. Only six are recognized, but in history, we've come up with two other names of people that were killed in that area during that time. Would we go to the next slide, please? The next slide. Okay, 103 years passed. No, let's go back one. And then the Newberry Six lynchings, we had a ceremony in 2019. And this was well attended by people from all around. We even had the Senator from Orlando to come up to this activity here at uh, the church. It was held at the Pleasant Plains United Methodist Church on August the 18th at 5 p.m. And we lit candles for Jim Dennis, Stella Young, Mary Dennis, Bert Dennis, Reverend Josh Baskin, and Andrew McHenry. These were the people that are known to have been killed during the time of the Newberry Six. And we wanted to give presence to their lifetime. The picture that you see, it came out of Georgia. And this was from another service where several people had been killed in Georgia, but we're not dealing with their lynchings today. And that is the picture that we use for this uh, occasion. Would we go to the next slide, please? Thank you. Now we're leaving Alachua County and we're going down to Ocoee. Ocoee is right outside of Orlando, Florida. They just had a big celebration there for 100 years. The Ocoee massacre occurred November the 2nd of 1920. And November the 2nd of 2020 was the time of the uh, celebration. Now it was a celebration of hurt, but it was a way to remember what had happened. Now, these people, African-Americans, got in line in Okoye and waited to vote all day. Four o'clock came. Some of them had been standing there since four or five that morning, getting in line to make sure they could vote. Four or five that evening, they still had not voted. The African-Americans were still in line. The whites had walked in and voted and gone home or wherever. So we had a gentleman to go up front to ask, why have we been in line all day and we can't vote? Or we have not voted and you have ignored us all day. And this gentleman by chance had his rifle with him. He was an African-American man. And when he went there, um, somehow or another an altercation started and the gun went off. He didn't shoot anybody, but the gun went off in the ceiling and folks ran. And then that started what was known as the Okoye Massacre. Now, the mob forced Black people to run. They ran home as quickly as they could, telling everybody that there was going to be a problem. The mob fled to Okoye. People came from o Orlando and all around. And it was evening. It was dark. It was 5.30, 6 o'clock. Remember, November gets dark early. The houses and the churches were beginning to get burned. The dogs were hollering and screaming. The people were running to the woods. We've interviewed four people that were aware of that particular Okoye massacre through their family members, through their family members. And of course, a lot of people lost their lives. Right offhand, they said 30 people, but there were more than that. And after that time, no African-Americans lived in Okoye until the last few years. They had to live in Apopka or in Orlando or other places. 
Now we have a picture of July Perry to the left here, serving as a deacon of the church, and he was a labor leader. He was a very well-to-do African-American. And of course they caught him, he was hung, and he is buried in Orlando, Florida. I have been to his grave site and we've had services there for him. I want you to look at the source called Lester Dabbs and his dissertation is listed at the end and it gives all details concerning the massacre. But recently we interviewed some African-Americans whose grandparents had told them about the case and we got a different uh, perspective. Please move to the next slide, thank you. All right. The next slide brings us to 1923, which is the Rosewood massacre that occurred in Levy County. We have an article of Time Magazine that was done by Victor Luckerson. And that article came out recently and it is available in Time Magazine. And I'm holding up the article right now. The article came out in uh, the month of April. And he talks about what happened. But the main issue now is reparations. Reparations in the US, as you can see from the bottom portion of the article here. The Rosewood story is that a white lady, Fanny Taylor, told us uh, a lie that a black man had raped her. And of course, that was not so as we know. And they thought this person was an escaped convict named Jesse Hunter and they thought he was hiding in Rosewood. Rosewood was three miles from Sumner, Florida, which is uh, just down the road, just take the railroad track and walk, walk down. And of course, since they weren't locating Jesse Hunter right away, they started uh, a riot, as they call it, but it was truly a massacre. And many of the African-American residents had to flee immediately, the women and children and so forth. They went to the swamps and to the woods, they had to evacuate quickly. And so in their evacuating, uh, the women and children were hiding in the woods. And by hiding in the woods, as they had to do, they were able to escape getting killed. But what happened on uh, January 6th, a train came through the Jewish, uh, drivers of uh, the Jewish engineers were John and William Bryce, and they took the women and children only, not the men, and the little boys to Archer, Florida, and Gainesville. So that is why we say Alachua County was involved because so many people went to Archer, Florida, and others came to Gainesville to escape, mainly women and children. And they had a lot to do with keeping Seminary Lane open for the public today. Would we go to the next slide, please? All right, now the Rosewood Shield is something that the family members put together in the, uh, in the 1980s. And the shield uh, gives you Rosewood established in 1845. That's when Florida was put together as a state in 1845. It mentions the house, African-Americans, some of them had two-story homes, not all, but many of them did. They talk about the fire that was coming around the home. They talked that African-Americans had picket fences and most blacks didn't have that. That was a sign of good living, a sign of a two-story home. The flower rose represents rosewood. The train represents taking the women and children and a few small young guys out of rosewood. The woods were the hiding places, the moon was shining. It was January of 1923, started on January 1st and last to January 7th or 8th. And at the bottom is Florida. And they wanted it depicted as the state of Florida was in burns and the fire and the town was burning down. So this is the Rosewood Shield created by family members and approved for their use. Please go to the next slide, thank you. The Rosewood is in Levy County. And this is the first mention of the Rosewood riot in a religious publication. And this was in the Church of God by Faith Handbook, the second edition by Nathaniel Scipio and his wife, Delilah. 
And this was in 1937. People were frightened to talk about Rosewood. The only place we could find information was in the main newspapers that had written AP articles about what happened. This is a picture of uh, Elder Scipio. And this is a picture of several of the people at a meeting in the Church of God by Faith, which was founded in 1914 in Archer, Florida. Would we go to the next slide, please? The Rosewood Family Reparations Updates. This is very important. In 1994, the renewal interest in the uh, Florida legislation was able to pass the Rosewood Bill, which entitled nine survivors want to receive $150 in compensation, $150,000, excuse me, in compensation. This is the only African-American massacre to receive reparations. And this is extremely important. That's why people all over the world want to know about Rosewood. How did you all get this reparations? Yes, the Jews have received reparations, the Japanese, the Italians, other cultures, but not African-Americans, especially for atrocities as what has happened to us. Now, in 1995, the Rosewood Heritage Foundation was founded by family members, but the key thing is over 280 Rosewood descendants have received higher education scholarships as of 2020. Scholarship money to go to college is very important. And this was a part of the Rosewood Bill to make sure their descendants could receive an education. And most of these students have attended Florida A&M and Bethune-Cookman uh, University in the state of Florida. Now, at the bottom, you have an article that was written by Robert Samuels on the Rosewood Massacre and receiving reparations. And it was published in the Washington Post. And that was published in um, about three months ago. I will not be able to click on the link to show it to you, but you can come back to that at a later time and view it. Would you please go to the next slide? The next slide, thank you. In 1997, the Rosewood movie came out. We are unique. And I say we because I feel myself a part of the organization. I am not a Rosewood family member, but they have adopted me as one of theirs. <laughs> okay, the mom came through and uh, this is just one of the scenes from the Rosewood movie. The key thing, it was directed by John Singleton, who died in April of 2019 from a heart attack. I had a, a, the privilege of meeting him, and it was put out by Warner Brothers. So if you would, you might go back and check to see this movie again. It does have some fiction, but so much in there is truth, because they talked to family members and others who have been involved in knowing about this history. Please go to the next slide. The next slide, thank you. Now this slide deals with the uh, exhibit. The exhibit was something that we had put together. It was funded by the Florida Humanities Council, the Rosewood Heritage Foundation and Displays for Schools. And it was very expensive, but it has traveled the country to libraries, colleges, universities, and in several places within the country. Please move to the next slide. Thank you. In 2006, the Chicago Academy of Students and Chaperones came and visited Rosewood. Yes, all these students from the Chicago area. But I didn't get their picture. I wanted you to see the only living survivor at that time. And her name was Mary Hall Daniels. And she's sitting there with the red on um, with the white hat. And I wanted the public to have an image of her. She was the last living Rosewood survivor. She died at 98 years of age. And she lived in Hilliard, Florida, kind of outside of Jacksonville. And the others that are there were to support her. And the students were in awe to see a Rosewood survivor. She was three years old when she came out of Rosewood. So she did not know the story other than what her mother and her brothers and sisters shared with her. The Chicago Academy of Schools of Students and Chaperones out of Chicago is a black organization. 
And of course, the Johnson Company was helping to fund them. And most of us are used to reading Ebony and Jet Magazine. They were the ones that helped sponsor this group. They sent them here to Florida and they spent a week in Florida visiting different locations with one day dedicated to Rosewood. Would we go to the next slide, please? Okay, now another thing that we do with the Rosewood is work with the Florida Humanities Department and the Florida Heritage Foundation. For the last five years from uh, 2015 up until uh, this past year, the Florida has partnership with, the, uh, with us and the Florida Humanities Council to feature Rosewood. And this picture is featuring Carolyn Cohen, who is a poet and an author and does beautiful work. And this picture is showing the church over in Chiefland, Florida, at uh, one of the local churches there. So we just wanted to share that we've done a lot to try to spread the word and all of our different atrocities I'm sure are doing equally or more. Would we please go to the next slide, please? All right, we do a lot of bus tours. July 16th, the Remembrance of Rosewood uh, was done. And of course, Deborah Gould was our main uh, person who came and wrote the story of Rosewood. And then after she wrote the story, it was placed in the FYI. The FYI is the information booklet in uh, Levy County. And this is one of the pictures from the FYI showing the people. And most of these were from the Jewish community here in Gainesville. All righty, we, we go to the next slide, please. And keep in mind, our first tour was 1994 and that was out of, um, St. Petersburg, Florida. We brought in two bus loads from the institution. September 17th of uh, last year, Stacy Peters, who's very active in the Democratic Party, helped us uh, get a bill passed with the, um, and, and helped us to get uh, an okay from the commissioners of Levy County to proceed with the Rosewood Park. And here she is defending uh, helping us to get this Rosewood Park through. So thank you so much, uh, Stacy and her husband and so many others who have helped us. Please go to the next slide. The Rosewood Monument is a seven foot model, modern design and it has been donated to the state of Florida by artist Kenneth Sandin. And the purpose is to encourage brotherhood, peace, forgiveness, and tranquility from what happened in Rosewood in 1923. Yes, we have the monument, but now we got to get the land to put it on in Rosewood. And we're looking at Highway 24 as a location where people can stop along the road. It will have seating and it will be a place of tranquility where one can reflect and feel at ease. Thank you. Would we move to the next slide? Now, I mentioned Rosewood is global and I put a lot of time on Rosewood and I just wanted you to know, yes, we get calls and from everywhere. This is from a Harvard University student who once had lived in Florida and wanted to know more about it and wrote a wonderful paper that was presented at Harvard University this past year. So, Kara, I just wanted to include your uh, email. Would we please go to the next slide, please? The next slide is Anna G. Hopkins. Now, Anna G. Hopkins is from Australia. And a bunch of teachers came over from Australia in January. And they wanted to know about the Rosewood Massacre. Why? Because they've had massacres in their country and all over the world. So this is one of the emails from uh, a teacher out of um, Australia asking about giving us a tour quickly so we can see Rosewood while we're here in the States. And they had learned about it through the movie. Thank you. Let's go to the next slide. The next slide. Now, in 1947 to 48, you see those dates and then you see from 1952 to 53. Now you wonder why do we have two dates like that? Okay, we're talking about the White House. Most of us don't know what the White House is, 
The White House is a place in Mariana, Florida. Uh, it was a place where uh, they would send wayward young men who were having problems. They said they, they were stealing and fighting and doing other things and they would send them there. So we have, it still hurts, a book that has recently been written and I have a copy of it right here. My father's painful account of surviving at the Florida Industrial School for Boys by Marcel Smith Berry. And she is a librarian over in Jacksonville, but her father went to this particular place twice. And he tells about how harsh it was and how they would get beatings. Now, not only did white boys go there, but black boys and they were separated. And I know most of you know about this because during the time of Charlie Chris serving as your governor, a lot was done to support those men and what happened at the White House over those many years. Now we have 47 uh, of the dates that he was there. This was Robert Smith and he's now a Muslim. He has changed his name. And his saying is the power of truth is always final. And he is a wonderful person to talk with. So I just wanted to share that because that is another form of atrocities here in the state of Florida. I was trying to give you a variety. Please move to the next slide, please. The Groveland Four. This was in Groveland Ford in 1949. Now you see these three young men standing. There were four. These three young men are standing outside of uh, the cell and they were um, over in Rayford, Florida. And we'll see more about that as we go forward. These were young fellows. And of course the sheriff is the first one there, his assistant and the three gentlemen that are still alive. Now, uh, the three gentlemen, they're not alive now, but they were alive when this picture was made in 1949. You had Charles Greenlee, he was 16. You had Sam Shepard and uh, Walter Irvin. Those are the three that are standing. Ernest Thomas, uh, you heard about him quickly. All right, these boys were falsely accused of assaulting a white woman, Norma Padgett. Norma Padgett wrote a story and said that uh, this was a lie. And that story came out and was shared at the college and other places a few years ago. Of course, this happened in 1949. Ernest Thomas, who was one of the fellows of the four, he was killed July 26 of 49 by the sheriff's posse. And they said he was running and trying to get away. The other three boys that you see there, they said that was not so. So they just killed that man. Would you please go to the next slide? But before we do that, please read Devil in the Grove. That is a book that is outstanding. It gives you the story of the Groveland Four. It says the Devil in the Grove, Thurgood Marshall, the Groveland Boys, and the Dawn of a New America. That is by Gilbert King. And he is an attorney. It is an award-winning book. And you really need to read that to understand what it was like to be in the South during that time. Please move to the next slide. Okay, thank you. Four men were isolated during the notorious Jim Crow area in the US, the Groland Four. These guys were falsely accused of rape. They were pardoned years later and it was written about in January 13 of 2019. Charles Greenlee, Walter Irvin, Sam Shepard, and Ernest Thomas, who became known as the Groveland Four, were wrongly accused of raping a white teenager in Florida. Now they received a pardon from the governor in Tallahassee on uh, Friday, which was 70 years later. They're all deceased. And this was done on January 13th of 2019. I was invited to go to Tallahassee, but I did not make that trip. Would you please move to the next slide, please? All right. Now let's see the connection. On November of 1951, Willis McCall of Lake County shot Erwin and Shepard. Erwin 
and Shepherd while they were in his custody handcuffed. That first picture we showed you, that was before they got in the car to be carried back to their um, location of care. Now McCall claimed they had tried to escape while he was transporting them from Rayford Prison back to the county seat of Tavares for the new trial. Shepard died on the spot and Urban survived. Now Urban survived for a while, but this is how cruel these people were during that time span. Now, Harry T. Moore called the governor to suspend McCall. Moore was the executive director of the Florida NAACP. Moore demanded that McCall be indicted for the murder following the Groveland rape case. What happened six weeks later, Moore and his wife were killed by a bomb that exploded under their bedroom on December 25 of 1951, leaving daughters behind. And the last daughter just died probably less than four years ago, because this happened in 1951. Would we go to the next slide, please? Harry T. Moore. Today we have the Harry T. and Harriet V. Moore Memorial Park. And this is in Brevard County in Mims, Florida. Harry Moore was the first NAACP official killed in the civil rights struggle in the state of Florida. And he and his wife were both martyrs. Um, this is the building. It's a beautiful museum. It has all the facilities and this was done in 1994 was when the bill passed for that, along with the same time of the Rosewood bill. Would we go to the next slide, please? The next person we're gonna talk about is Ruby McCullum from Live Oak, Florida. Now, the reason we put her in here is because I wanted you to see from children, women, men, all age ranges and time spans here, are included, and we wanted to include a lady. So she murdered her physician in 1952. Ruby was a wealthy woman. This is a wealthy woman story. The account was on August the 3rd of 1952. Uh, it was the shooting death of Dr. C. Leroy Adams, a local physician who had just been elected to the Florida Senate. Now, Adams was killed in his office by Ruby McCullough, an African-American woman, rumored to be his love. And no joke about it, she was. The community said the kids looked like him. Read McCullough, Ruby McCullough, Women in uh, Swanee County Jail by William Bradford Hewitt. Adam was also involved with her husband. Her husband's name was Sam. He was a gambler. He had a Bolita business here in the state of Florida, similar to what you do now when you have the Florida uh, lottery. And of course, both were uh, raising their children. And of course, their last son passed away maybe three or four years ago. And um, he's up in the Live Oak, buried in the Live Oak area. And I've also been to Ruby's grave. She's buried up in that area as well. They, she died of a stroke at the New Horizon Rehabilitation Center at the age of 82. Now I put this slide here, but let's go to the next slide and you will see what a hard life she had. Ruby had several court cases. These cases were written by Zora Neale Hurston. We know the history, historian Zora Neale Hurston. And she wrote them for the Pittsburgh Courier newspaper. This strange case of Ruby McCullough was known throughout the country because she was a very well-off woman. She had houses, cars, and whatever she needed. Her husband had the, the money, but this showed how wealth kept her from getting killed. Yes, they declared that she was mentally insane. And of course she went to McClenney and other places of that nature and they made her uh, a martyr, so to speak. But this story one should read because it deals with class, race, and gender. 
and how people are treated here, not only in the state of Florida, but in the South. Would we go to the next slide, please? The next slide, thank you. Now, how to encourage community projects. Those are the ones that I picked to talk about, but there's so many more cases that we could deal with. Establish short and long-term goals as you promote understanding to work with people because it takes time and you have to have a, an outlook and you have to reach your goal so you can go to the next level. Read the local newspapers and books so that you will be familiar with the materials that are out here, such as Philaron Wright's book on civil rights. Now this was dealing with civil rights in Gainesville and in St. Augustine, Florida. This is Reverend Wright right here in Gainesville, who was the pastor. This is his son who wrote this book. There's a lot in here about local uh, Lachua County, as well as other areas. Work with cultural community organizations, such as your NAACP and other communities organizations. We have so many of them in our communities. Mentor students at school, church, and other organizational sites to help them to understand who they are and what they have to do to function in this world. We have to share languages. Everybody doesn't speak English, as we well know. We dress differently, our music is different, food is different, and other activities are different depending on the culture. So keep in mind that you're dealing with people from other cultures and that we're here to work together, not to separate. Please go to the next slide. Slide please. EGI, Equal Justice Initiative. This is what it's all about. The Florida leaders are here, but I want you to see Brian Stephen Esquire to the right, he is the founder of the Equal Justice Initiative in Montgomery, Alabama. He has a book called Just Mercy and he has a movie out also. He is the gentleman behind this. William Gary is the director of the Harry T. Moore Museum in MIMS. I showed you a general shot of the museum. Take your time and go there. Let that be one of your outings. And of course, I'm Sherry Dupree. But in any case, we were at EGI for the 30th year anniversary last year in the month of April. We were standing behind the EGI there and uh, they got a quick shot of us. Please move to the next uh, picture, please. While we're going now, I wanna show you some materials that will help you with EGI. This is called Equal Justice Initiative uh, 30th Anniversary Celebration. This was why I was there. I've been there four times already to, for different meetings and occasions. And this was our personal book that was given to us. We were there for three days to celebrate. And also a new monument was put up while we were there uh, at that time. Another source that you need to uh, look at from them, uh, well, I have many sources and I guess to save time, I won't pull out all those sources. But another group is Visit Florida, directors of the historical civil rights event. We usually meet in Orlando and other places, not too much in this area, but uh, these are some good friends of mine. Um, I will point out uh, the lady in red, she's over in Jacksonville, does so much for Jacksonville communities. This is, uh, of course, Bill Gary right next to her. And the others, I won't go around all of them, but this is an attorney here, uh, attorney. Um, we have two attorneys in our group. And uh, the, the goal is to keep the history alive. And we also work with EGI. Everybody is with EGI because they are the ones that are our backbone in helping us to keep things going. But through Visit Florida, we're able to get a few things done. And they have helped us so much with the Rosewood bus tours. Would we go to the next slide, please? We have people here from St. Augustine and other places. Now, how to locate facts about hidden history. Oral interviews allow you to fact check what you have covered. People can tell you many things, but you want to fact check what they have shared with you. Talk to families 
Talk to secret societies, yes, your masons, they're not gonna give you much, but they'll give you clues to help you. They were very helpful with Rosewood. Go to educational institutions and look for materials and share. Civil rights and other materials are available to you. Research archives, communities, churches, state, national records, and so forth. Visit historical sites, tours, memorials, cemeteries, and plantations, of course. Communicate in all forms with email, text, phone, website, blog, social media, you have different ways. Visit research centers and military is one do not leave out because so many of our people went through the military railroads research centers cities states genealogy places look at food art cooking clothing dance and recreational activities and above all keep organized records so you can stay abreast as to what you're doing please move to the next slide Locate historical facts in conducting your oral history interviews. They're so important. Meet with civil rights leaders in your community and directors. Attend family reunions and meetings where you can share history. And of course, seek religious publications. They are very important. I can pick up so much from religious publications and you can too. We can tell through religious publications when an atrocity has occurred, and one day we'll talk about that. Let's move to the next slide, please. Question, what can American citizens do? Repair negative relations and systematic histories of inequities that still mark our local region? This is a question that we must keep in mind as we proceed to look for our history. Please move to the next slide. Okay, what we can do is enjoy music and respect other people as well as ourselves. And this is just one picture here to show that. Please move to the next slide. All right, another thing we can enjoy learning by going to meet with local groups and local citizens. In October, we were down in Bronson at the Women's Club. We got more history from down there. Each woman could tell us so much about that area that we did not know always feel comfortable in talking to your community people. Please move to the next slide. The next slide. Alachua County, visit the Civic Media Center. Well, yes, and of course the Martin Luther King Center, the Gainesville Cotton Club. I put Vivian Fowler's name for the Cotton Club. Carol Thomas for the Social Justice. Uh, Faye Williams dealing with the Porters community. Evelyn Fox for dealing with the NAACP. Chuck Chestnut, because he's in charge of EGI for Alachua County, and he's our commissioner. Tony Jones, yes, because yes, he's with the police department, but he's captain and he knows people and situations. And you can always find information through your police departments. And then invite local leaders and friends to be a part of what we are doing. Please move to the next side. This is just showing some music from the Cotton Club. Support local Gainesville events, the Fifth Avenue Arts Festival, African American Art, and have a chance to talk and meet people as you go from place to place. Please go to the next slide. And of course it was closed. Now, seek and you shall find historical tours, news of various sources, exhibits, family pictures and albums, state and national documents, especially your census is most important. Movies, online chats and blogs, relate materials, and insurance is most important. Local support, land deeds, very important. Memorials and genealogy will also help you find materials about families, friends, and atrocities. Please go to the next slide. Equal justice initiative is what it's all about. These are questions that you might want to come up with. And I want to make sure you remember the places that we visited today. Newberry 6, Rosewood, Groveland 4, Okoe, Mims, Half Moon, Mariana, and Live Oak. These are just a few of the places that we visited today in our tour. Please go to the next slide. 
Now, these are the sources and these are very helpful. So you can go in and click on Half Moon and read about what happened to those two young men that were killed. Uh, Lynch Hammock, there's a slide on that. On Newberry 6, there are slides. Okoy, uh, you definitely want to look at Lester Dabb's uh, dissertation that dealt with the uh, riot in Okoy. Please go to the next slide, please. The next slide, please. Rosewood interviews uh, are very good. The Rosewood Shield, we have that. Preparations, uh, reparations, you can talk about that. And then we also have a slide dealing with the exhibit. Please go to the next slide, which is our last one. Okay, you may just leave that on the screen, but I want to show you a couple of books that might support you. This one, if you can see it, it is called, it's by Walter Mosley, it's called 47. This is one of my favorite books because we didn't have names during the time of, of being uh, involved in plantations. You just had a number. That was all that was necessary for them to know who you were and to keep track of you. So many of us did not have names. Another book is Democracy Abroad, Lynchings at Home. And this is dealing with lynchings in Florida, just lynchings in the state of Florida. It is an excellent book. And it is by Tamika Bradley Hobbs, right here in Florida. We have one by uh, Emancipation Portrayed, and that is by um, Ortiz, Paul Ortiz. Now, all of these are from the Equal Justice Initiative lynchings in America. They have a series on that. And these books are so that you can bring them in and use them in the classrooms and for different activities, Girl Scout, Boy Scout groups, what have you. We have one that's called Lynchings in America. These are confrontations and problems of racial divisions here in the United States. And there are others that I want to mention just briefly that you can gather. There's one from EGI called Segregation in America. There's another one from EGI called Slavery in America, the Montgomery Slave Trade. This is dealing strictly with Montgomery. But there are so many materials that they have that we cannot say we can't get what we need to get research done in our communities. And of course, we have to have those interviews and personal touches so we know where we are going. I wish to thank you today for this time and the questions are now open. So uh, we go back to um, Thank you. Davis. Uh, thank you very much. Um, if you have, we're kind of out of time. If, um, if someone has to leave, uh, please go ahead. Thank you all for coming and for being witness to this um, talk about truth about our history. Uh, we, it, Sherry, if you could hang around for a little longer, we could take some questions. And I know Susan Hatch, you had your hand up. Do you want to ask a question? Yeah, I was wondering whether or not the local schools incorporate any of this material and whether or not they take field trips uh, to incorporate some of this material, um, some of the things that you just shared, Sherry. And thank you very much for presenting today. Oh, yes. Well, I have been on the Florida Task Force for a long time for the state. And yes, they are supposed to do that. But some of the teachers refuse to do that. And some of your uh, materials are not shared as they should be. I have tried to do workshops throughout the state of Florida and some of the teachers refuse to even come to the workshop to get credit. I mean, we're giving you credit so that you can work toward keeping your certificate. So yes, and then the other issue, a lot of your superintendents will not support. Now, Alachua County was in compliance. Um, but they, uh, I don't think they are anymore. Uh, only 10 counties in the state of Florida are in compliance with teaching African American history. Mm -hmm. That's true. Florida, County is, only 10, is not those are down near Miami and in those areas where you have a high uh, concentration of cultures and they force the teaching. I used to go down to Miami all the time. But in this area, we have done some things, but little compared to what needs to be done. So we're open to working and helping to get things more in tune 
there, there's an element here of kindness and then there's an element of hate. And you got to work and bridge the gap between the two to get things done. So, yes. Um, my understanding is that uh, the, the Remembrance Committee in Newberry has been working with someone at UF to create a curriculum about this, about the Newberry lynchings, and that is being offered in Newberry. Now, in Gainesville, the history of lynching is only offered for the African American history classes, which is an elective, and we didn't even have them until this year. So we are way behind. We're coming up. We're coming up. You got to keep fighting the battle. Yes. And the and materials are there. And then for Black History Month, many times uh, the different counties, that's when we really struggle to get to all the counties to cover something for Black History Month. And usually they only want to talk about Martin Luther King and those well-known African-Americans, not the local people and not the issues that are affecting their communities. So that's the difference there. Um, are there any other questions? I don't see any hands. Thank you so much, um, Sherry. That was really a wonderful presentation and very fascinating. And we've all learned a lot. Um, and I think the fact that, you know, we, many of us have lived in Florida for many years and are pretty educated and well-read and yet are still learning this speaks to how much this has been uh, suppressed, how much of the truth has been suppressed. So thank you so much for bringing this to light. Well, thank you for allowing this the time. Thank you very much. Well, All thank right. You, uh, thank you very much on behalf of the Sunday Seminar Committee. We I want to say this was a very moving and uh, powerful presentation. We hope to be able to get back to this topic uh, again uh, many times. Thank you very much for putting it on. It's been really eye-opening. Thank you. No, thank you. All right. Thanks so much for coming. And again, Hi, if anyone... Hi, Hi, Robin. <laughs> Got to have a little pandem pandemic hello in here. Oh, my gosh. I'm just looking. I know her. I know him. I know quite a few. So it's good. I, I almost feel like I'm at home here with some of these people today. <laughs> and you kind of are in your home. <laughs> I am. I am. <laughs> All right. Well, we love you and appreciate you, Ms. We'll Mr. keep Brent. doing this work of truth and reconciliation. Thank you, everyone, for your support. Good Thank job. You. Good job, good job. Uh -huh. yes, You're excellent. Uh-huh. Bye. Bye-bye.